Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now's a great time to grab your pens and weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already, because the service starts in 90 seconds.
much for spending time with us today. We're so excited about today's service. We believe that this could be the best and most impacting hour of your week. Throughout the service, you may have some questions, comments, prayer requests, and if so, go to churchexperience.tv slash connect or pull out your camera app and hit up our QR code to connect with us. Better yet, if you always want to know what's going on here at CE, just hit that subscribe button right down below. We'd love to hear from you, get back to you, and to be praying for you. We're ready to dive in. Stand with me as we sing some songs of worship to Jesus.
We're clearing off the surface. You're coming into focus. We're going back to the basics, the glory of your face is the reason why we do this. Yeah. The winds of worship blowing. Yeah, the doors of heaven open. Jesus, you're at the center. Lord, help us to remember the reason why we do this. Yes, it's all about you. Yes, it's all. it's all about you Lord we lay our life down we give this life to you God we're so thankful for what you do and God we just want to worship you with our lives we give it all to you and we pray this in Jesus mighty name amen
This week, Die With a Smile by Lady Gaga and Bruno Mars. Hey, welcome to Church Experience and welcome to Top of the Charts 2024. This is one of our church's favorite teaching series that we do all year long. And the reason why we love it so much is because every week we listen to one of America's top songs. These are Billboard's top 100 songs in our country. They're the songs that are being played in the malls that we shop in. They're the songs that are being played in the restaurants that we dine in. These are the songs that are being played in the vehicles that are driving past our church locations every day. These are the songs that are influencing our culture for good and bad. And so we're taking the lyrics of these songs and we're comparing them to the teachings in God's word every week. And we're learning valuable life lessons and every week bringing it back to Jesus. Well, I'm so happy that you're here for the kickoff of Top of the Charts 2024. And today the song that you heard is called Die With a Smile. It's written by Bruno Mars and Lady Gaga. And it's really interesting how this song came about. Bruno Mars was at his studio, and he invited Lady Gaga, who was at a different studio, recording her own studio album. And she came over to Bruno, and they met up around midnight. And as the story goes, uh, he had already been working on this song, and they started to collaborate. And they stayed up all night long, and they finished this song. Think about this. They finished writing and recording this song in one day. They released it later on. It was actually a surprise release. They announced it only one day before it was actually released on August 16 of this year. And so it's a new song, but it has already climbed to the top of the charts. In fact, this song made it to the top of the global Billboard Top 200 Songs list around the world. And it has topped the charts in over 20 countries. It is a smashed hit. In fact, it's a really beautiful song. It's very popular, not only because musically it's a really good song and there's great vocals, but also because of that theme. I think the theme really captures people. There's, there's two lovers, right, and they're cherishing love and they're cherishing life while also wrestling with their own mortality and what it would look like at the end of life. And, and it's really interesting to think about this because there's so many songs, not just this song, but there's so many songs about the end. There's movies and books that are written about the end, and yet it's, a, it's a really a small event in comparison to the whole of our life. And with all the themes of life and all the years of life, you only die once. There's only one true ending of your life here on earth. Jennifer and I were at a recent funeral, and we were there to support a family in our church. I was helping officiate the funeral, and at the end of the funeral, we got in our vehicle to drive home. My, my wife of 22 years starts describing to me what she wants me to plan for her funeral. And I just stop her mid-sentence, and I'm like, babe, don't tell me how you want your funeral, because I don't plan to be around for it. <laughs> like, I love you, and I don't want to be there when you're not there, right? Like, I, how I plan is, like, late in our 90s, after we have celebrated our 75th wedding anniversary, like we can die peacefully together in our sleep. Like that's how I have a plan. <laughs> but the truth is none of us know what tomorrow holds. And one of the lyrics in that song that we just heard, Die With a Smile, it says, nobody's promised tomorrow. Now that's true, right? God has ordered our steps. He knows the number of our days, but we don't know how many days we get. Now there's gonna be two dates on your tombstone. You already know the first one. You know when you were born, but you don't know the day of your death. But whether it's through cancer or a car accident or Jesus comes back in our lifetime, we know that there will be an end. There'll be an end to our life here on earth as we know it. And yet this, this date of our actual ending here on earth only happens once. There's many days throughout our lifetime that feel like an ending, right? Right? Like, you might be in one right now, and you're like, yeah, it feels like everything is over. Like, I had aspired towards this ambition, and it's, it's over. It failed. It didn't work out. Maybe it's a doctor's report, and your health is changing, and you're like, man, things are never going to be the same. Perhaps it's the changing of a season, and, and you just realize that things are going to be different from this point on. There's many throughout our country that had this similar feeling in recent days. As Hurricane Helene swept through our country, caused devastation, flooding in Florida, mountain towns in North Carolina that are no longer there, all, all kinds of havoc in between. And it's, it's wild what happened in such a short period of time. And some of the, the news anchors were saying things, and, and, and news authors were writing things like this. This is a post-apocalyptic aftermath 
what happened through this storm. And what they were saying is, this is kind of what it would look like at the end times, right? Like when everything is destroyed, these, these cities that once were are no longer. And, and they're just saying the devastation was, was catastrophic. There's many times in life where we feel like, we look around and we say, I mean, everything is over. I have no more hope. We drift into despair. We get discouraged and there's fears that fill our mind. And it's, it's in moments like that when you feel like all is lost. Maybe you're there in that moment right now. And you feel like, I, I have no hope. It's in moments like that that a simple love song is just not enough. And as good as this song is, it's not enough to sustain us in the moment when fear and anxiety grip our soul. So what do we do in those moments? How can we prepare ourselves for the moments that feel like it's all over and all is lost? Well, thankfully, God's word gives us truth to help us know how we can be prepared for those moments when it feels like it's all over. Take a look with me, if you will, at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. God's word says, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with him to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace is reaching more and more people and may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Come on, help me preach today. Everyone say eternal. Yeah, eternal. It's helping us reach an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Come on, say it again. Say eternal. Yeah, it's eternal. So... This passage is really good. It starts out talking about how Jesus is, is our, our real hope. And, and there's times in, in life when we feel like things are all over and, and we feel like the end is coming. And, and what I like about this and how it starts is it reminds us that the worst thing that can happen to us here on earth, the end, death, it's all over. The worst thing that can happen here on earth has actually lost its sting because of Jesus. Because Jesus died for our sins. When we die, if we've received Jesus into our life, if we've been forgiven and saved, when death comes, we don't look forward to judgment. We look forward to paradise, to be together with Jesus for all of eternity. So we have much to look forward to. So in other words, death has lost its power over us. Death has lost its sting. And it's, it's saying because of Jesus, because he rose, because he resurrected, we know that we also will be resurrected when we die. So the end has, has really lost its power over us. So we don't have to live in fear of an end that could come sometime unexpectedly. We live differently in relationship to the end. But I, I want to point out something in, in this passage that I, I think will really help you because it's, it's, it gives us hope to know that death is not the end. But we also need help. right? We need, we need hope and we need help. And so Jesus gives us hope, but, but God is also going to give us some help and how to navigate the endings of life. Let's, let's look back at the passage again, verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So, so I like this. There's a contrast here between what's happening on the inside and what's happening on the outside. He's saying, hourly we're wasting away. The things that we see on the outside, we might not always like. We might be in the middle of a storm in a very dark time, yet there can still be light on the inside. Inwardly, we can be renewed, as it says, day by day. So in other words, when, when things are breaking down around me, God can still be building up things inside of me. He can be growing my faith. He can be developing perseverance in me. Lives can be touched and good things can be happening even though my circumstances are terrible. I might feel like, man, this is over. All is lost. In the midst of those circumstances on the outside, on the inside, God could be growing love and joy and peace. I love in, in God's word, uh, chapter 8 of the book of Romans, in verse 28, it's, it's a verse that... Uh, 
that, that I heard so many times growing up, I almost kind of drifted away from it. And, and it wasn't top of mind, but then I, I've refound a love for this verse that was so familiar to me growing up. Romans 8, 28, I love it. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And so in the midst of whatever circumstances you're in, and for good or bad, God is, is growing things inside of you. He's, he's working out things that are good for you because he loves you. Because he loves you and he cares about you. You know, in the midst of pain, sometimes we can be robbed of our praise. So don't let pain, when you're going through difficult circumstances and dark times, rob you of giving God praise for the good things that he's accomplishing in the midst of it. The good things that he's already done for you and the the good things that he's wanting to do inside of you. Let me give you a practical example. So many of you that were a part of our church, you know, when when things happen in our communities that, that we wouldn't choose... We're the kind of church we go out and we serve. We we help make a difference. We we, we help try to be light in the darkness. And and I saw this recently at a number of our church experience campuses that were affected by Hurricane Helene. We went out into the community and they were serving people. Storm surge had flooded people's homes and all sorts of things. And and, and church experience people were going out and serving and helping those in need. And I, I just think that's so beautiful. That's your church. And and one of the things that's so cool, one of the guys I talked to personally, his name was Johnny, and he went with us to some homes that we were helping cut out walls that had been destroyed and hauling people's stuff out to the curb. It was a really sad situation. But in the midst of all that, as, as he was leaving this neighborhood, all these homes had piles of rubble along the side of the street that needed to be hauled away. And they were just getting rid of just almost all their belongings that had been ruined in this, in this flood. And, 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 and he saw a skateboard, of all things, that had been put out in one of the piles of rubble to be thrown away. Perhaps someone thought that it was no longer usable for whatever reason, and, and he saw it there, and being a skateboarder himself, Johnny said, you know what, that is actually still usable. And so he grabbed it off the trash pile, and he found a young child that, that liked the skateboard, and he said, would you like this skateboard? And he gave that skateboard to that family for that child. And, and I thought it was a beautiful thing because Johnny had the eyes to see in the midst of the ruin, in the midst of the rubble, he still found something that could be rescued. He still found something that had value to it. And when we're in the midst of dark times, sometimes we forget to look for the light. But I remind you what it says in Romans chapter 8, that in the the middle of all times, in the middle of all circumstances, God is working for the good of those who love him. And sometimes we forget to look around with eyes of faith to see what God is wanting to reclaim and redeem and restore and rescue in the midst of our struggle. Right when we feel like all is lost, he said, outwardly we we might be wasting away, but inwardly we were being renewed day by day. In other words, God is accomplishing good things in the midst of the bad things we're surrounded by. Here's the lesson. I want you to write it down. Look for treasure among the ruins. Look for treasure among the ruins. The ruins. The next time you find yourself in a dark space, the next time you get discouraged and you look around and you think, this is the end of whatever it was that I hoped for, perhaps the very end, know that even in those moments, God can renew and build up on the inside while everything else on the outside is breaking down. Never give up hope because our hope is in Jesus. Right on? Right on. The lyrics of this song been studying them all week and kind of looking through them. And this opening verse says, I just woke up from a dream where you and I had to say goodbye. And I don't know what it all means, but since I survived, I realized. I've been looking at those words, I realized, I realized, I realized, I realized. Um, what did he realize? What, what, what are some things that you might realize, well, according to the song, wherever you go, that's where I'll follow. Nobody's promised tomorrow. In other words, life is short. And don't we realize that sometimes when we have like a near-death experience or, or we're faced with death, maybe a, a loved one or a friend or somebody like that, and you attend their funeral, and then you begin to realize, man, life is, is pretty short. I mean, the mortality rate's high. You with me? The death rate holds steady at 100%. And that's like the elephant in the room of life, you know, and you can't get around it. But our culture sure tries. Our culture says phrases like, you know, we're trying to beat death. We're trying to avoid death. I haven't found anyone successful at that yet, except for Jesus himself. 
We're trying to postpone death. We're trying to do everything we can to make our lives healthier so we can extend our time here on this earth. Because although we know it's coming, it's the elephant in the room, we don't like to talk about death until we have to. And even though we try not to think about it, we all know the reality is someday we'll die. One day, as the song said, the party will be over and our time on earth will be through. Someday. If you've ever walked through a cemetery, there are some things that you see on every grave marker, all right? On every grave, you see the date that person took their first breath and the date that person took their last breath, right? Look, look what I'm talking about here. Uh, look at this first one. Frank Sangs, all right? He was, was born in 1871 and died in 1948. Anybody in here related to Frank Sangs? Okay, just checking, just checking. You never know. Or John A., look at this next one, 1872 to 1851. Or how about uh, Fanny Shockley Taylor, 1880, 1950. This is kind of an old cemetery, isn't it? Or this next one, E.L. Mason, 1835 to 1920. Or check out this name, you know, John George Vandergeesen. I think that's how you pronounce that. I could be wrong. 1888 to 1950, or Joseph Ashoff, 1923 to 2006. And look at all these on the, on the screen, all right? They're all on there, all have different names, all have different dates, but they all have something in common. You see what it is? What every one of those six markers have in common, what do they all have in common? They all have the dash. That little line in between the date they were born, the date they entered into the world, and the year they died and left this earth. It's the dash. And life's not so much about when you were born, and it's not really about so much when you die. Life really is about the dash. that little line in between those dates. It's about what happened in the dash. And someday you and I are going to have a grave marker where there's going to be a date, the date you took your first breath, the date you took your last breath, and in between, you're going to have a dash. The dash may be seven years long. The dash may be 70 years long or as long as 97 years long. But it's all a dash just the same. And so to finish up this message today with Pastor Brandon, I want to ask you a question. What are you doing with your dash? What are you doing with your dash? Your answer to that question is the true reason as to whether or not you can die with a smile, as the song suggests, right? You see, you and I, we all think the dash is going to last forever. We all think this moment of leaving this earth, the end of the dash is somewhere way down the road, way in the distance, that we have plenty of time to figure out what to do with our dash. Some of us are still trying to figure it out. But in reality, your dash or your life here on earth is extremely short. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. James talks about it in chapter 4, verse 13. says this. Now listen. All right? He's talking to you. Listen. Listen, because this is not how most people think. Listen. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Doesn't that sound like what we do every single day? Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Look at this. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Do you understand that? 
This is what God's trying to help you see today. This, this is your dash, all right? It's like a little spray bottle I've got here, okay? I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but, you know, spray, then it's gone. That's your life. Spray, it's gone. Spray, it's gone. That didn't last very long, did it? But according to James, that's what your life is. You are a mist that appears for a little while, and then it's gone. That's life. Life is not a statue that's going to stand forever. Life is a mist here today, gone tomorrow. We need to come to a realization that that's, that's the truth. We don't like to talk about that. But it's very clear that's what God's Word says. Look at Psalm 90, verse 10. Psalm 90, verse 10 says, uh, Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Look at another psalm. Psalm 39, verse 4 says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire life is just a moment to you at best. Each of us are but a breath. It's gone. I'm not getting you wet, am I? All right, good. It's gone. Your time on earth, your dash, maybe 70 years, 80 if your strength endures, you know. Whether it's 15, 42, 92, whoosh. Just a little mist and it's gone. What God is saying today, don't forget that truth. Your dash is very brief. But also more than just the realization of that, Apparently, what happens in the dash impacts eternity. You see, life is very short, but eternity is what? Very long. Let me tell you what I mean by that. See, death at the end of your dash is not the end of you. Death is not your termination. It's rather your transition into Eternity. I want you to pretend this rope goes as far as you can possibly see. Okay, it doesn't. It stops at the wall. But let's use our imagination that this rope goes as far into the distance as you can possibly see. It goes way out of distance. You don't even see where it, where it ends. All right? It just goes on forever. Just pretend. Now imagine this rope is the timeline of your dash, the timeline of your existence. And you just exist forever. I mean, it goes on forever. It goes on forever, okay? You see this red part? Do you see the red part? Maybe hard to see. Do you see the red part right here? That's your dash. That represents your life on earth. You've got a few short years. It's a mist. Here for a moment, then it's gone. And then you have, not the end, all of this. <laughs> and what you do with this impacts all of this. This is your existence. And what blows me away is that for some of you, all you're thinking about is the red part. You're consumed with it. When it comes to determining how you live your life, it's the only thing you're thinking about. The here and now. What can I get? How much can I make? How much can I have? How much can I enjoy? I mean, you go, you go like, you know, you know, I can't wait to get to this part of my life. You know, I'll work really hard, really hard, really hard, and then I'll get to enjoy all this right here, right? 
Most people, that's what they think about, the dash. But I'm like, well, are, are you kidding me? That's all you're living for? What, what about all this? Are you thinking about all this? Uh, are you thinking about eternity? Are you thinking about this going on forever and ever and ever and ever? It's, it's eternity. Life is short, but eternity is what? Long. Life is short, but eternity is what? Long. Man, it's crazy to me because the Bible clearly teaches that what I do in the red part determines this part. Why would I spend this little red part only trying to make myself as comfortable as I possibly can, enjoying myself as much as I can, when this part impacts all this part? You see, the closer I begin to walk with God, I begin to realize some things. I'm thinking about the moment when my dash is over and I'm face to face with Jesus. Because I realize everything I do is going to be looked at through the lens of eternity. And everything I do in this dash will either bring me regret or it'll bring me reward in eternity. Let's say I've got an extra $1,000, okay? I don't really have an extra $1,000, but let's just say I've got an extra $1,000. On that day, when I transition, when I, when I see Jesus, on that day, what is going to bring me reward and what's going to bring me regret? And I could buy a lot of fun things with that $1,000. A lot of fun things for myself with that thousand extra thousand dollars. But if I'm looking at that day, if I'm looking at this and keeping this in mind on that day, and I stand before Jesus, maybe I'll spend that thousand dollars differently. Maybe I'll give that thousand dollars to some ministry, some opportunity. Maybe I'll give that thousand dollars to the poor, to the homeless, to feed some people. Those are the type of things Jesus says we'll be rewarded for in eternity. Versus the alternative of, you know, regret. I mean, we've all bought things we regret, right? You know, that was a waste of money, and that was a waste of money, and I'm really not using that as collecting dust. That was a waste of money. I mean, we do that all the time, don't we? Think about what you're going to say at the end when you stand before God. Are you going to regret maybe the car you drove or regret maybe the house you lived in, regret, regret the clothes that you wore? What are you going to regret doing in the red part when you get to this part? How about your time? How you spend your time in the red part? Are you going to say, oh, I'm so glad I watched 7,000 uh, movies on Netflix? I mean, that's what you're going to say to Jesus when you stand before him? Are you mastered some video game? It was really cool, Jesus. I mean, I got all kinds of lives and weapons. And Are you living your life, seriously, the things that you're doing every single day as if your life is a mist, as if when you're gone, you've got all this to consider? Are you, are you living that way? Now, I'm not saying having nice things is wrong or watching movies or playing video games is a sin. That's not what I'm saying. But, but with the end in mind, with all of this in mind, what am I doing with my dash? Am I living for the here and now and that's it? Or am I living with eternity in mind? See, that changes things. Many things we could give our lives to seem irrelevant with this in mind. God's priorities seem much more urgent and much more critical because His priorities for our life have eternal impact. See, when the day comes and we face God, and we won't, we won't get another chance at, at this. We won't get another chance at that. 
We've got one chance. Hebrews 9.27 says people are destined to die how many times? Once. And after that comes judgment. What did you do with your dash? What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with following me? And so I don't know about you, but I don't want to be fooled into going the world's way. I'm not going to spend my life down here living, living for just this part. I want to live my life for this part. Because life on earth is short. But eternity is what? See, some people look at some of the decisions I've made. You know, the world would look at some of the things I've done for, for the cause of Christ, and they say, hey, you're so stupid. You're, you're so stupid because, you know, making those sacrifices and, and giving up some of the things you've given up, man, that's really going to affect this part. And I'm like, no, you're so stupid. If all you're thinking about is this and not this, Come on! You'd have to be a fool. Now I look at people sometimes. You know, I look at some of the decisions that they're making. They're saying, "Man, that's so that's so crazy. Why why are you doing that? Why are you choosing that over the things of God? Why are you doing that and forgetting about the consequences? I mean, not even knowing if you got tomorrow left." And you think that's smart living and I'm dumb? Doesn't make any sense. And I know it's tempting. It's tempting for all of us. It's crazy. Everyone lives this way. Everyone lives for the red part. Everyone lives for the here and the now. No one's thinking about the millions of years in eternity. It's this crazy deception that we've all kind of bought into that We've shaped our entire lives around. We've shaped our families around it. Our priorities are shaped around it. All for the red part and not the rest. But I know deep inside your heart, deep inside your heart today, even if you've never thought of this before, before today, deep inside your heart, I know you have a heart that feels there's got to be something more than just this. There's got to be something more. And as your pastor and your friend, I got good news. There is. There is. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, God put eternity in the heart of everyone. That's why each person longs for more, longs for more than the world could offer. There's a God-shaped void in the heart of every single person that can only be filled by God and His eternal kingdom. You are made to be an eternal being. You're a spiritual being meant to live forever. You have been given a heart for the eternal kingdom of God. And our deepest heart's desire, our deepest thirst is for that kingdom. It's for the eternal kingdom. We long for something more, something bigger. And we try to satisfy it with all kinds of things in this red part, in our dash. We try to satisfy that longing. But the only thing that's going to fill it is Jesus Christ. The only thing that's going to fill it is to living for something for eternity not just the dash. And when you fully realize that life is really just preparation for eternity, you'll start living your life differently. You'll start prioritizing things in your life differently. There are eternal consequences to everything we do here in the dash. Every act of your human life strikes some chord in eternity. How many of you like the movie Gladiator? All right, I see that there's a, a second one coming on. I don't know if that'll be as good as the first one, but 
you know, in the words of General Maximus Decimus Meridius, he says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. And I couldn't agree more. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Echoes. What we do here, it's going to echo here. It impacts this. How many of you were excited as a kid when your report card came out? I see a hand. All right. Some of you are, some of you are that way. How many of you dreaded it like crazy? You're like, you get a, like a sick feeling in your stomach, you know, it's coming, it's coming. Dread it. Teachers who teach young kids say that students behave really well the day that report cards come out. But by then, the day report cards come out, it's too late. Because the grades have already been earned. It's already down in the book. It's already been determined. Someday, each of us will receive a report card with how we live life on this earth. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. It says this, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So at the end of your time on earth, at the end of your death, you will stand before God, and it will be determined whether you spend eternity with God in heaven, with all the rewards, all the benefits that you can imagine that would include, or you will spend eternity separated from God for all of eternity. You're going to spend eternity someplace, either with God or separated from God. And if separated from God, it says the blazing furnace of hell, there'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth, certainly not a place I want to go or that I want you to go. But you're going to spend eternity one of these two places. Life on earth is short, but eternity is what? The message translation says there will be a lot of desperate pleas on that day. That it won't do any good. The grades will have already been earned in your dash. There's a story about a college student who was approaching the end of the term. He's still needing to complete a major paper in order to graduate. And after sleepless nights and many tiresome trips to the library. He completed his paper and he finally turns it in at the last minute. Three days later, when each student received their work back, the student found these words from his professor written on the top of his paper in red ink. Good research. Great illustrations. Wonderful big bibliography. Grade F, in all capital letters, wrong assignment. That may or may not happen to me. I don't know. But listen, I certainly don't want to stand before God, my creator, on that final day and hear him say, you know, nice house, great career. Nice boat. You finally got the boat. Wonderful salary. Great life. Great F. Wrong assignment. So with that end in mind, what then should we do with our dash? With all this in mind, how does it determine, how does it affect the way you live your life? If our dash is just a mist, there it is and then it's gone, shouldn't it make a difference? If we start thinking about this, if we start thinking this way, shouldn't it make a difference with how we live our life and what we do with our life? Because I don't want to just be doing things or saying things or getting involved with things without really considering what counts. Because my dash is just a mist, and I don't want to waste my mist doing things that don't really matter in light of eternity. C.T. Studd 
was an amazing missionary. He sacrificed so much. If you ever get a chance to read his biography, I'd encourage you to do so. He sacrificed so much just to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wrote these words. He said, two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only what's done for Christ will last. Again, what are you doing with your dash? Only what's done for Christ will last. I know you've got other good things you want to be involved in, but listen, listen, listen. In light of eternity, is it really something you want to be involved in? Only what's done for Christ will last. This is not your permanent home. This is not your final destination. You're not just pass, you're, you're, you're just passing through here. There's something that lies ahead. Look how Paul put it quickly. Philippians 3:13 says, "I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead." All right? Now we could stop right there. That would make a great inspiring TikTok video. We could just stop right there, but Paul goes on. He says this with eternity in mind. He says, "I press on to reach the end of the race, to receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. That is Paul's thinking of eternity in mind. Not just the here and now, not just the red part, not just the dash. He has his eternal future in mind. He's going, man, I'm really looking forward to what lies ahead. Are you looking forward to that day? Are you looking forward to what lies ahead? Paul says, I'm not going to get distracted and live like the world lives. I I'm focusing on the end. I'm focusing on eternity. I'm keeping my eyes on the finish line. I'm going to live this out, and someday I'm going to face Jesus. I'm going to come before him, and I'm gonna, he's going to judge what I've done, how I live my life. He's going to hand me a report card, and someday I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, because you knew me, had a relationship with me, and lived for me, Enter into your heavenly reward. That's what I want to hear him say. I don't want to hear him say, depart from me, you evildoer. All you did was live for yourself. I never knew you. We didn't have a relationship. You only lived for the, this life. You've already received your reward. So now you're going to be eternally separated and thrown into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Paul says, for me, I, I'm looking to the finish line. I want to receive the heavenly prize to which God through Christ Jesus is calling all of us. I want to finish out with just a story about a man named William Borden. William Borden had this same kind of mindset as Paul had. Living life with eternity in mind. William Borden was born in 1887. You see it there on the screen. In Chicago to the very wealthy Borden family. This is the Borden Dairy Company. Same, same type of family, okay? Lots of money. They got the mascot, you know, Elsie the cow. Same family. When William was a young man, his mother became a Christian and started taking William with her to church. Parents, don't ever underestimate taking your kids to church. Don't think any Sunday doesn't matter. You never know when the calling on their life is going to come, and you don't want to miss it. His mother started taking him to church. He became a Christian at the age of seven. He was sent off to a boarding school in Pennsylvania for his high school education. When he graduated at the age of 16, all right, his parents gave him a gift, a trip around the world. Again, this is a wealthy family, a trip around the world. As a 16-year-old, he would not take the trip alone, of course. He, he took a pastor, a missionary with him by the name of Walter Erdman. He went with them on this trip. They visited numerous countries along the way. Borden saw firsthand 
what he called and what they called in those days heathenism. All right, that's a word we don't really use much today. But heathenism means like a group of people who who don't have anybody witnessing Christ to them. Okay, they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this left such an impression on this young sixteen-year-old. He knew in that moment when he started seeing these different places and seeing these different people groups, God rose up in his heart a burden for these people who had never heard the gospel before. And he wanted to give his life to being a missionary for the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he returned back to the United States in 1905, he went to Yale University. There he excelled at academics and at all sorts of athletics. He was on the boxing team. He was involved in yachting. He was engaged in track and field. But while he was there, he still had this burning in his heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he didn't wait until he got to the mission field. He started impacting his fellow students right then and there. He started a Bible study. He started prayer groups that eventually involved the majority of every student at Yale. By his senior year, 1,000 of the 1,300 students at Yale were involved in a Bible study that he had started. Borden also became known for ministering to the most oppressed in the town. He started the Yale Hope Mission. And in one year, 14,000 men had attended a gospel meeting. 17,000 received a warm meal, and 8,000 found a place to sleep. He had a burden in his heart. Between his academic and athletic abilities and his leadership skills, Borden clearly stood out. He was a leader. And with his family connections, Borden could have pretty much done anything in life that he wanted to do. But he remained committed to his calling to be a missionary. The public couldn't understand his decision. Especially after his dad died in 1906, his dad left him more money than he could ever need, ever do with. An opportunity to take over the family business. You know, most people would jump at that chance. They wondered why a millionaire would ever want to become a missionary. A friend of his even told William that he would be throwing his life away as a missionary. What are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. Borden replied, well, you've never seen the people I've seen. You've never seen heathenism up close. People who have no idea that God loves them. When he graduated from Yale, he knew he needed some more education And so he enrolled at Princeton Theological Seminary. When he had graduated in 1912, he was ordained as a missionary, and he became aware of a certain people group in China. There were 10 million Chinese Muslims without the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was no one going to witness God to them. This is a very difficult people group to reach. Very difficult people group to even get to. But Borden was determined and committed. This is the group God's calling me to reach. He decided he would go to Cairo, Egypt, to learn Arabic so that he could minister to these Muslims in China. He left America in December of 1912. On March 21st, 1913, he became ill with spinal meningitis. 19 days later, at the age of 25, William Borden died. April 9th, 1913. He never made it to China. When the news of William Borden's death was cabled back to the U.S., the story was carried by nearly every American newspaper. A wave of sorrow went around the world as people were amazed how the heir to millions gave it all up to be a missionary. After he died, his Bible was returned to his parents. When they opened his Bible up, they saw on the pages in the beginning these words written by William. No reserves, no retreat, no regrets. No reserves. Next to those words was written a date. And it was the date when he decided that he would not take up a role in the family business. He would become a missionary. 
And that was the date. And he said, no reserves, no reserves. A later date, around the time of his father's death, when it would have been tested again. Again, his father left him millions. Again, his father left him the family business. Here it all is, laid out for him. And around that same time in his life, he wrote, no retreat. In other words, I'm not going back. And then during his illness, after March 21st, there was another date inside of his Bible. And he wrote these words, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. This is the life of William Borden. This is the life of a man who wasn't just living for the red part with all of its millions and business success and all that he could have had. No, no, no. William Borden was living for this part. If you should ever visit his grave in Cairo, Egypt, you will see several things written on his gravestone. I've got a picture of it here. There, there, there are two of his favorite verses on there from Psalm 119, Mark 16, about the Great Commission, hiding God's word in his heart that he might not sin against him, some of his favorite verses. But near the bottom of the gravestone, There are written some powerful words. Near the bottom, look at this next picture. At the bottom, it says this. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Apart from faith in Christ, there's no explanation to turn down all that. But because we have faith in Christ, we believe that this is not, this is not the end. the world, it doesn't make sense. Apart from faith in Christ, there's no explanation for such a life. Shouldn't that be the words that describe how we live our life as well? I mean, shouldn't that be what's written on our gravestone someday? Apart from faith in Christ, there's no explanation for how this guy lived, how this gal lived. There's no explanation for it other than he loved Jesus and he saw eternity and he knew that someday all that he was doing in the red part, all that she was doing in the red part was going to impact all of this. Apart from life, apart from faith in Christ, it doesn't make any sense. To someday stand before God and know that you lived your dash with no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. And the good news today is, church, listen to me. This can be the way that you live. This could be the, the way that you live out your dash. Do you know why I know that? Because you're still breathing. Okay? You're still here. Your dash isn't finished yet. You've been given the gift of another day to write the story of your dash, starting today, starting here, starting now. In other words, you're, you're still alive. God's put a gift in your hands of, of life, a precious gift that's just a short mist. It's just a short mist here on earth, and then comes eternity. A life that makes no sense to those only living for the red part. May it be said of us that apart from faith, there is no explanation. Apart from faith in Christ, there's no explanation for this life. You want to know how to really die with a smile? Live like that. No reserves. No retreat. No regrets. I'm living for eternity. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this message to challenge us to be the type of people that live with eternity in mind. Help us not to just live for the here and now, for the red part. Help us not to forget, Lord, that our life is just a mist here today and gone tomorrow, that what we're really living for is what's happening next, is what's coming. God, we want to hear, well done. 
So draw us close to you. Help us to live for you. Challenge us to go further, to go deeper, to be willing to sacrifice what the world says is important for the things that you say are important. I pray that for everyone who is here today, that that would be the story of their life. Apart from faith in Christ, it would make no sense. If you're here today, and you're not sure where you stand with God. You're not, you're not sure if you stood before God today whether or not you, you would go into heaven or you would go to hell. You're not sure. And today you want to make sure. Today you want to make a commitment that you're going to start living in light of eternity. If that's you today and you want to make sure, say, say I want to begin living this way. Would you just put your hand up? Nobody looking around, just put your hand up and right back down. Yep, all over, all over, all over. Now listen, if you don't know Jesus today, if you don't have a personal relationship with him, today's the day to start. Again, nobody's promised tomorrow. And so if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, but you'd like to have one starting today, if that's you, would you just put your hand up? I don't have a personal relationship, but I would like one today. Yes. I would like everybody just to repeat after me this prayer. I don't want anybody praying alone, so everybody repeat after me out loud, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth. I'm sorry for the way that I have lived. Please forgive me. Change my life. Change my priorities. From here on out, I want to live for you. Change me from the inside out. Jesus' name. Amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer today, you've been born again. God is in your life. Can we just celebrate the life change that God is doing? Before our usher teams come forward to receive our tithes and offerings and response cards, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. The aftermath and cleanup from Hurricane Helene gave our CE family the opportunity to unleash compassion and make a difference in our communities. Together, we were able to unleash compassion to a number of CE families to help with the cleanup efforts due to flooding in their homes. To all those who gave their time and energy to make this possible, thank you so much. When we serve together, we grow in a relationship with God, other believers, and we want to introduce those to Jesus. Thank you for coming together to support one another and be the light of Jesus in our community. As our ushers come forward to collect our response cards and to receive our tithes and offerings, God tells us in his word that he loves a happy giver. When we joyfully return our finances to God, we count every gift a joy to give. Knowing that our generosity pleases God, moves his kingdom forward by changing life's eternity, impacts our surrounding community, and is a blessing to those in our entire church family. Your giving really matters and makes a big difference. You can easily give online, mail in a check, or give in the offering buckets in the service. We also recommend taking a few minutes to set up a recurring gift through our website, which is the best way to give consistently. Thank you for your faithful giving to God through church experience. Please stand and join us in a closing song of worship.
worshiping and learning with you. You may have made a commitment during the service, and if so, we'd love to have you reach out to us. If you have questions, comments, prayer requests, go to churchexperience.tv slash connect or scan the QR code on the screen. Want to get even more connected? Check out our CE social media, Instagram, Facebook, website, or app, and go ahead and hit that subscribe button right here. What a great day it's been. We can't wait to see you next week.